Hello there and welcome back again. And for this session, we have our very own Ellie Wade from the Maxon training team. Whoop. And um, it's, don't just take my word for it, but the, very often we get fantastic feedback from our audience when we run our webinars, because that says Ellie is not only an amazing artist, but is really good at manifesting how you do the stuff and yeah. explaining it. And my so mum's the best. Yes, she is. She comments all the time. She does, yeah. <laughs> So I believe, Ellie, you are going to be talking about Redshift, but yes. you've got some interesting things to share about Redshift that people might not know, especially because they're recent updates and so on. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And just to kind of like set expectations, it's the same presentation as yesterday. So if they saw that, then they will know them. But if not, then yeah, some new stuff. Similar content, but new jokes. <laughs> no, they're all no, written down. All, that's only one. That's that's all, there's only one joke. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was it. It was the mum one. <laughs> yes. Excellent. All right. Over to you, Ellie. Cool. Thanks. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Good to, good to be back again. So yeah, just to kind of like set those expectations. This is the same presentation as yesterday. However, if you do have questions for me, I've sort of said to Simon, feel free to kind of like interrupt and we can go off on a tangent, which you know I love to do on live presentations anyway. So yeah, my name is Ellie Wade, I'm part of the Maxim training team. I'm a trainer and 3D workflow specialist and I specialize in Cinema 4D and Redshift. So yeah, a lot of my job is doing these live sessions, live events, uh, demystifying post-production, uh, working in an incredible team, uh, a whole variety of things that I can, I'm gonna show you in just a sec anyway. But I'm also on Instagram, I'm on at, at it was Ellie, don't even know my own bio apparently. Um, so feel free to, you know, follow me at like, DM me if you have any questions with like projects or you, you want some help with some stuff. I also give all my project files out on there and any kind of like materials and assets I create are all like for free. So feel free to like check them out and you can have them and you can use that stuff. I deliberately use or build things from scratch or use kind of like royalty free assets so you guys can have those project files from all the live sessions that I do. And just to kind of like cut out away, this is something I didn't really talk about uh, yesterday. And that is the Maxon training team, the incredible Maxon training team, like a great group of artists and kind of creatives that I work with and that I learn from every single day. And they have a whole bunch of live sessions that they do. And so I wanted to talk about that, what we like to call housekeeping on our live sessions here at Maxon. And so the first thing I want to talk to you about is the events page. If you just head over to maxon.net slash events, you can see all the stuff that's coming up, the live events. And then we also have the the, the kind of like the, the live sessions or the webinars or the workshops that we do as a as a training team. So on Mondays we have demystifying post production where we tend to pick a new topic every single month and then we tailor those Monday sessions to those to those topics and we do it across a wide range of the Maxon tools. So everything from Cinema 4D to Redshift to Red Giant to Forger to ZBrush, all of that great stuff we do on there. And also, we do love to hear your feedback. So let us know at uh, training at maxon.net what you'd like to see, because genuinely, believe it or not, we read all the comments, we read all your feedback, and we do tailor these sessions and, and kind of like the workshops that we do to the stuff that you, you guys want to know. Because at the end of the day, that's, that's why we do this stuff. And I do want to talk about the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. So if you don't know, I mean, I don't know how you don't know because I talk about it all the time. And we have our own Maxon Training Team specific YouTube channel. So all those sessions I was just talking to about, talking to you guys about, talking to you about like the Maxon events page, all of that stuff gets recorded and gets uploaded onto the Maxon Training Team uh, YouTube, which is this this little guy here. And we also put everything into a relevant playlist. It's all timestamped thanks to the amazing Dr. Sassy. So even if it's just a little quick tip that you want to know, you can, uh, you can check that out. And yeah, all of, our, all of the different series are all on here. So this is something I didn't get to talk about yesterday, but of course is very near and dear to my heart. So getting back to what we're actually going to be doing today. So a quick overview of the stuff that we're gonna be talking about. As we said, we're gonna look at the, some of the new features that have come out recently in Redshift. So the Redshift dev team works super hard and they're getting releases like <laughs> on kind of like a monthly basis. And recently we had 3.5.5 and 0.6, and that included some volumetric updates, uh, random walk, subsurface scattering, black body emission, and some extra things as well. So I'm gonna see what my time is like and how many of those I can get to. Again, if you have questions, let me know. Uh, but if I, if I miss anything or if we run out of time, then not to worry because, you know, as I said, this was yesterday's presentation. 
So random walk is the first thing we're going to look at. Subsurface scattering, which is just so much more simplified now inside of the uh, if, in the new standard material in 3.5, which came out in April. So let's dive into Cinema 4D and let's have a look at that. So I'm just going to build a nice simple scene from scratch just so you guys can see how how easy it is to actually create these materials. So I know sometimes like if I have my lights, my, my beautiful lights set up and I create a material, some people will be like, hey, yeah, that may seem easy, but you've already got like eight lights. Well, I'm going to show you with a couple of lights, a simple object and one material. So in the asset browser, I'm going to grab this dragon model. So if I just open this up, this is from Eric Smith. So thanks, Eric, for modeling this so I don't have to. That is fantastic. And I'm just going to take this model and drop it into a new scene. Let's come into here. And we don't need that material because we're going to create our own one. So my reason for this is nice and simple. We have some nice detail. We have some nice thin areas and some nice thick areas. So when it comes to working with subsurface scattering, it's 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 going to help us because we're going to have some light traveling in certain areas. We're going to have some kind of like saturated color. It's just going to be a nice way of representing subsurface scattering inside of Redshift. So a few things I need to do. I just need to change my renderer and I'm going to just change my output. And then I'm going to throw in my Redshift render view. And so this is where for anyone that doesn't know or hasn't used Redshift before or any third party renderer, my render view is going to show me all the kind of updates I make inside of my viewport and it's going to give me a bit of a render preview. So when I add some light, I add some materials, I'm going to see it in the left hand side of my viewport. So if I kick this off, it's not going to look too nice, but we can, it's a good starting point. Cool. So we can see now as I sort of like come in and out, you can see it update on the left hand side in here. This is the way I like to work. There's also a viewport IPR so I can change this area if I wanted to, but I like to work this way. So we can agree not looking too fancy and that's because we need to set up a few things. And so what I say about subsurface scattering, there are three really important things. The first one is lighting. At the end of the day, subsurface scattering is how light travels and gets scattered inside of a medium or inside of an object. If we don't have lighting, we don't have light scattering, therefore we don't have subsurface scattering. So those are the things we set up first. And the second thing is going to be object scale and size. That is very important and we'll see why in just a sec. And then the final thing, of course, is going to be our subsurface material. So let's start off by creating some of our lighting. So our lights can be found down this little area here. And we're going to grab ourselves a area light. And my nice uh, lazy, lazy person way of targeting a light is to throw on a target tag and then just throw in whatever object you want your light to be targeting. And let me just move this to the back, maybe move it up a little and out. And now we can see on the left hand side, we have some lighting showing up. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Cool. Yeah. Happy with that. So again, you know, we don't have enough light in our scene to see everything in detail. But what I do like to see and what I do like to do with this area light is it's already going to give me an idea of where the light is going to scatter most and the more intense parts of my object. So we can see these white areas is where our light is going to scatter more. And we're going to have more of that light traveling into that object. And then we have these dark areas, which are going to seem a little bit more diffuse because we're going to have less light being able to kind of travel, travel towards them or through them. So let me just throw in one other light just to create some overall ambient lighting. And the way I do that is to throw in a dome light. And then with a dome light, we can drop in a HDRI image. Again, let me just take it from the asset browser. So that's what I love about the asset browser. I, I take so many kind of materials, HDRIs, like surface imperfections, objects, all from this asset browser without having to, to, leave, to leave Cinema 4D or to have to kind of buy some. So let me drop my texture, my HDR image into there, just this GI empty room, it's kind of my most, <laughs> if you've seen any of my sessions, you'll know that it's one that I use most frequently. It just creates this really nice lighting. But what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna actually just disable my background because I don't wanna be able to see this background here. So I'm gonna switch it off. Cool, so nice and simple, if I switch these off, we've taken it from this, which we can all agree, not looking too great. I mean, we're all artists here, right? And then we can switch this back on. 
and we've got some nice lighting going on. And this is going to help when it comes to creating our subsurface scattering material. So what I talked about yesterday was like the main differences between the old way or the previous way of creating subsurface and now this new way using the new standard surface material, which is probably one of the biggest things that came in in the April release of Redshift 3.5. So if I just create a Redshift material, so this is the previous default material, and it's also what at the moment uh, defaults as we kind of double click and we create a Redshift material. So this is what we have as like the previous, like pre 3.5 uh, base material. But what I'm talking about is using the standard surface material, which is this one here. And it's just a more industry standard way of working. And it has a lot more simplified ways of working. For example, when it comes to creating metalness, like let me just drop this on here. We can create some metalness like really, really easily and quickly. Uh, and I can show you that by literally sliding one thing. So if I pull my attributes up, we have a metalness slider. I can pull that up. And then we have metal, I told you, super simple. So yeah, this new standard surface material makes creating materials uh, super, super easy without even need to worrying about going into, um, into nodes. And subsurface is one of those things that has been made simpler. Take it from me, I'm not very technical. I do like to kind of repeat this, just to <laughs> set expectations that I'm not a very technical person and I had to learn and teach the previous subsurface, which is these settings. If we kind of come into the previous redshift material, scroll this down, these are these settings. So for me, before I even kind of like worked with redshift or subsurface, I didn't really know what attenuation was. I didn't know what absorption or scatter coefficient was. I didn't know those things. I mean, I came from like a sports coaching background. So, you know, get me to kick a ball. That's cool. Get me to explain subsurface. Not so much. But if we take a look at the new standard surface material and we have a look at subsurface, we can all agree these settings and the way it works is just a just some more artist friendly like I like that I have a color and a weight value I have a scale which once I explain it will make so much sense and we also now have the new mode which is random walk so I'm going to show you don't just like take my word for it I'm going to show you how simplified subsurface uh, actually is so let me just get rid of this old material because we don't need that one so I've already thrown my redshift standard material on top of my little dragon guy here and we have that default gray, the default gray plastic that we all know and we all love. So my starting point is normally when I'm building up subsurface is I remove my diffuse and I remove my reflection because I don't want those to kind of be in the way of the material that I'm creating. And so inside of Redshift, a lot of things have a weight value and the way to look at this is it's basically switching this particular setting on or off it's like enabling it or disabling it and we can have partial weight values but for me i just think of it as like an on or off so if i don't want a diffuse which is what i don't want all i have to do is come into my weight value and switch that down to zero we can now see that uh we have no diffuse now it's just gone completely black but we still have our reflection so what we need to do is we need to switch that one down and then everything disappears. Not really, it's just gone completely black so we can't actually see it. But this is great, this is a good starting point and now I can enable my subsurface. So if we come down, what's really great is we now have a weight value in here. So as we, as we just learned, we now know if we wanna enable subsurface, all we have to do is switch on our weight. So all we have to do, slide that up to the number one and now we have a 100% weight value of subsurface and we can now see that in the left hand side. So I haven't switched on diffuse, I haven't switched on reflection. This is now showing subsurface scattering. So the next thing I would do is as an artist or as a creative, I'd then go, okay, what color do I want my subsurface to be? And the important thing here when we're talking about subsurface is this could be a wide range of different materials. It isn't just like a subsurface material. It's a, it's a type of um, sort of material based on the light scattering. So we could have wax, we could have skin, we could have jade, we could have things like milk. All of those materials in the real world have what we would call subsurface scattering. So 
these settings you're going to want to adjust based on the type of material that you're creating. But what I'm going to do is just show you like an overall what, what they do. So for me, now I'm going to choose the color. We're going to create like a bit of like a JD material. So let me just click my color. And all we're going to do is choose the color that we want. Nice and easy. There we go. So very quickly, we've turned on our subsurface. We've enabled it with our weight. And now we've chosen the color. And we have it showing. The next thing we're going to want to look at is I'm going to kind of skip over radius. We're going to get back to it. But we're going to have a look at scale first. And just to kind of like, just to kind of explain what scale is for a start, it's in the unit of your DCC. So your kind of software of choice. For me, I'm in Cinema 4D, as we can see. And that is in centimeters. So this scale setting is set to one centimeter. And what the scale is, is how far our light is going to travel into our medium and then be scattered. And so when I say that third thing, which is that scale uh, and understanding the size of your scene and the size of your uh, models, this is why knowing that information is really important because you want to get, I want to adjust your scale based on that size and also based on the material that you're creating. So for me, this model I know is very, very big. So if I click my Dragon model and we click on our coordinates, we can see right on that bottom right, we have 388 by 509 by 383. Pretty big, let's be honest. It's a pretty big model. And so what that means is, if we come back to our subsurface and uh, down here, so our light is traveling one centimeter into our medium and being scattered. And so we're getting this, I don't know, maybe like a waxy, rubbery looking material. But if we want to have that more, like more of a subsurface type effect, all we have to do is increase this scale value. The light is going to travel more into our medium and it's going to be scattered. But it's also going to, it's, it's going to create some more transparency and it's also going to kind of lose some of that saturated JD green color. So let's go to a value of 10 centimeters. And I'm just going to let it process a little bit. Cool. So we can now see, especially in the areas where we have the intensity, the more like kind of intensity of our area light, and also in the thinner areas of our object, we're getting a lot more of that light scattering, and we're almost losing that jade color. But we're creating this really nice subsurface, so this subsurface look. We can go further. So if we go up to 30, what you'll notice is we just exaggerate that effect even more. So we're creating almost more uh, translucency a bit more of like a like a jellyfied look and we're also losing some of that green color because we're having so much of that light scatter through our medium let's cut this back down to 10 because i quite like this look and i quite like the detail that we get if we sort of like come in this detail that we're getting around here so this is where i want to talk about random walk so random walk is a mode it's a subsurface mode inside of here and what it does is it's clever enough to calculate the size and the thickness of our model and of our object and so we're getting that more accurate subsurface especially in these small thin intricate details whereas point based diffusion or ray trace diffusion what it is is it's an, appro it's an approximation of that sizing and so we get very different results uh, and and I mean, my personal opinion, not as nice results because, as we said, Random Walk is able to see that thickness, see that size, and give a much more accurate, especially on those details, uh, subsurface effect. So let's take a quick look at Ray Trace Diffusion. And if you sort of just like, you know, memorize that image on the left hand side, I'm going to change this to uh, Diffusion. And if we let it clear up a little bit while I'm talking, we can see that we almost completely lose those like the light scattering in those details we lose that kind of that transparency area and that's because as we said it's like an approximation of the size and so like for me this might be a style that you're after but i definitely think the random walk is just such a nicer model and all it is is just a simple click so we can go from this now with the new version to get something that just looks really really great and really easy to to create what you also notice is we have this anisotropy value and that was grayed out in the previous versions so it's only available with random walk and what anisotropy is it's the light directionality and so what we mean by that if i sort of come out a little bit 
what we mean by that is is at the moment as our light hits our medium it's getting absorbed up to a scale of 10 centimeters and it's getting scattered in all directions so if anisotropy set to zero it gets scattered in all directions we can do positive and negative values and that is effectively going to change the light scatter direction in uh, towards the light or uh, away from the light source which in our case is our area light as well as our dome light and we can use this to create slightly different looking materials so if i enter quite a high positive value we get as we can see like a very very different look so we're scattering away so what we're getting is like this this really kind of like translucent brighter look almost almost like a glassy look and we can go the opposite direction by doing a really kind of uh, bold negative anisotropy value and so we're now getting a more diff a more diffuse looking material uh, more kind of like uh, like waxy rubbery without having to adjust the scale so all these settings kind of go hand in hand with one another uh, to allow you to create whatever type of subsurface material whether it is you know like a milk or jade or like a glass or a um, just just a nice kind of overall subsurface effect so we kind of skipped over radius but let's let's talk about radius a little bit because it's what i'd say maybe the most advanced setting in in the new subsurface but even then it is not uh, too advanced especially in comparison to you know some of the previous settings so all i've done is change my color my subsurface color to white and the reason for that is because what the radius does is it allows us to control each individual color channel for rgmb and that is why it is represented by a color chooser and not a numerical value so what i mean by that is i'm able to actually tell redshift or tell the subsurface material that we do or don't want one of these individual values to be scattered within our medium and so what i mean by that is if i don't want the red channel or like that so imagine our lights coming in and it's getting scattered if i don't want my red channel to be scattered i can actually just disable that we now have that bright blue or that cyan color uh, being represented even though i haven't ch changed the color of my subsurface i've just changed the uh, the the light the individual light ray uh, r channel what you will notice though is we do get some redness over the top and that's because we don't we're not like eradicating this red the red channel rays and so what they're doing is as they hit the surface they're remaining on the surface of our object we can do partial values so if i just kind of divide this by two now effectively what's happening is as our as our blue channel hits our surface it's being absorbed fully up to a scale value of 10 centimeters and it's being scattered fully green is partial so we've done a bit of like a 50 percent of green and the red isn't being kind of absorbed and scattered at all so we can combine this to, cr to create some more creative and artistic results so if i combine this with my color channel and kind of come into here maybe choose like a bluey color and we're now starting to get some pretty interesting looking results that we perhaps weren't really getting with just an individual color because we're controlling the light scattering of our rgb channels and this is important so a question that came up yesterday was talking about how you'd create skin and this is kind of like the way like let me see if i can <laughs> i may absolutely like like bomb hard now but let me see if i can try and recreate a semi semi skin color if it doesn't work then hey that's what that's what lives are for me embarrassing myself all right so let's do like like a skin color maybe something like this and then maybe we'd want like our red to sort of be kind of traveling through and so that's sort of like similar ish of course it's going to involve a lot more tweaking but it sort of represents this sort of skin pinky color and then we have that redness value that you would have uh, inside of the skin we've had a question oh okay yes. 
If you were um, wanting to do skin, but then you wanted to do different skin tones and different skin types, what would the approach be for that? It's just simple as changing the color. Uh, I would say so. Yeah, just as simple as adjusting the tone inside of uh, inside your color chooser. I'm sure there is a much more advanced way of creating skin uh, that I just haven't had the time to play with. But this is, if we're looking kind of like just like a, a base level understanding of creating skin, then yeah, this definitely is a is a nice workflow for that. Thanks for your question. Cool. Let's have a look at the time. Right, let's go. Let me just show a couple of extra things uh, when it comes to subsurface. And that is the uh, subsurface scattering GI. So let me just hide my little dragon guy. And I'm going to create a super advanced scene with a plane and a cube. And just change this to maybe something like that. Cool. Right, so again, let me just very quickly target my area light to my cube and move this guy a little bit further in. Cool, yeah. So as we see here, all I've got is my cube, my plane, my area light. My area light is casting this shadow right here. And we have this dark shadow, and that's because we have a fully diffuse cube going on but what if we had a cube that had subsurface scattering well then we'd want to see that color represented through uh, those through into that shadow so let's just really quickly create another subsurface material get rid of our weight for our diffuse and reflection switch this guy on and maybe make it like a red value okay Maybe, there we go. Right, cool, so yeah. As we would in the real world, if we had a subsurface material, slightly translucent material, as the light hits it and it travels through, now in that shadow area, we're seeing this redness, we're seeing this color, which we would do, and this is thanks to subsurface scattering GI. So this is a new feature that's sort of, uh, one of those ones that's like not a front-facing feature, but it does make a big difference. Uh, and I can show you the difference if I actually switch off or kind of disable this new GI. And so in case you don't know, if you head over to the Redshift menu, go to Advanced, go to System, there is a Legacy dropdown. And what this is, is this is the, all of the, like, kind of like the legacy settings for backwards compatibility. And so as we can see here, we have Subsurface Scattering GI, and this is the new way that it is working and the more physically accurate way that it's working. We can see this on the left-hand side. We're getting that nice color. Prior to this, so before this, this sort of, um, this, this release, it was an approximation. It was a diffuse approximation. So it'd kind of try and like guess and calculate how much of that, that light or that color that should be represented in the shadow. And I can show that by actually just checking this and it's going to almost this is going to disable this new feature. This is what the legacy, the legacy menu does. So if I switch that on, you can see we're not getting the same amount of redness. We're getting some really dark shadow, even though we can see our material is actually pretty translucent. So as we can see, we're not getting a really accurate representation, whereas this new GI is giving us exactly what we would have potentially in a, you know, in a real world scenario. So a little feature potentially in the back end, but will definitely make a difference. So a final quick thing I want to talk about is setting up translucency and how we can do that uh, in the previous way versus the, the new way. So again, I'm going to create one of my you know, super simple scenes. I'm going to keep this plane, grab a sphere, just pull this up and then just grab the two, scale them down them down and duplicate them she says <laughs> there we go okay right so let me just switch off my target tag and I'm just going to make this shine through and this is because we're going to set up some translucency on our plane so what we're going to do is we're going to be able to see that sphere yeah 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 we'll leave it like that I don't want to spend too much time on it Okay, right, so let's kick this off. And here we go. Right, so if we grab a, uh, 
a normal Redshift material, so kind of like the pre 3.5 version, not the standard surface. If I throw that on my left plane, nice and simply, we can, cr we can create translucency really, really easily. So again, diffuse and reflection, we can switch off. Just to be clear, we don't have to switch these things off. I just like to do it just to represent uh, the individual feature that I'm talking about. We can then increase our translucency and we can choose our color. So we can see we've set up some translucency nice and simply inside of here. And we can see that sphere over the top. If I create the standard material, throw that on here, and we look into here, we can see that our base properties are slightly different. So we actually can't see a translucency uh, mode or input inside of here. So for anyone who's used to working this way, a lot of people like to work with translucency, especially when you create like leaves. It can be used as like, like a way of faking SSS without actually having to do SSS. That's kind of how we describe it before. And so the way that we create that is in the new standard surface. I'm going to do the same thing so you know I'm not cheating. Switch off my diffuse and my reflection, come all the way down. And the important thing first is this geometry tab. We have a thin walled option. So if people create like uh, little bubbles, often they'll check this thin walled option. It's basically telling Redshift that our object, in our case our plane, has no thickness. Once I do that, if I just scroll up now in my subsurface, we've actually grayed out a whole bunch of those settings. All that we have left is our color and our weight. Perfect, they're the only things we need anyway. So we can put our weight value to one. We can see we're getting our translucency. We can change our color and we're now getting the exact same translucency method. If anything, it actually just looks a little bit clearer. And so these are kind of the new, this was, this was a lot about the main focus is random walk, but I also wanted to talk about the new Redshift 3.5 standard material. Cause even though like it, it's funny cause like it, it came out in April. So for me, I, I use it all the time. So I forget that it's still actually a new feature. And I forget that there are so many people who still aren't really aren't using it, aren't really sure about it. And so I want to kind of, you know, demystify some of these settings inside of the standard material and just, just show you that it is a really great way of working, whether it's for metalness, subsurface scattering. We also have thin film. Like I really like would love to dive into thin film, but maybe this will be a session for, for another time. It's just a, a really incredible uh, tool inside of the standard material. Okay. So yeah, that was, that was a uh, random walk and subsurface scattering. I'm just sort of time checking myself. So I do have some volumetric updates that I want to talk about, but the main thing is, uh, is kind of a new feature. You know what, let's, let's have a little look at the volumetrics very quickly. I'll set this up nice and quick because we have some really great new features, uh, which is anisotropy, which is how our volume reacts to incoming light. I talked a lot about this yesterday, but the big thing is black body emission, and that's going to allow us to uh, create really nice, realistic fire and smoke explosions. So let me do that. Let me show you that before showing you a little, a little sneak peek new feature, which is new if you didn't see yesterday's session, but if you did see it, then unfortunately, you know my secrets. So just really quickly, this is kind of like, these are the volumetric improvements and we can now create this really great looking realistic fire and smoke. And that's kind of going to be the focus. So I'm working with a VDB that I got from Jenga FX. You can, you can find VDBs online and you can download those for free. Jenga has loads uh, for free on there. And that's basically what I did. And the way that we can bring this in is we just change this to redshift. Let me just change my output again. Gonna be moving a little bit faster this time. <laughs> and yeah, the way that we load in a VDB is we can go to the RS volume. Inside of the RS volume, we just have to locate our VDB. In my case, that's the gasoline explosion. So you might be used to working with exposure effects or flume effects where you can export VDB data or channel data inside of here. And the way that we can see this in here is for a start, we need to change our display preview to, to something that isn't off. In my case, I'm going to change it to points and just uh, have a few more points. And because this is an animation, I'm going to need to go into animation, go into mode, go to simple and detect frames. And now when I play, it's detecting my animation. If you're working with a still, like a, I don't know, like a still cloud VDB, you wouldn't need to do that. It would just come straight in and you see your lovely cloud VDB. 
And a question that came in yesterday was, can we do this with the volume builder? Yes, you can. I'm not going to do it. But all you'd need to do is you go into the volume builder, you go into fog mode, you create your volume as you would, like whether it is a, a cloud or something. I did this on a, on a recent session uh, at the C4D Level Up workshop. And then you would do this same method we're about to do with our lighting and with our, um, our volume shader and just throw that on there. So yes, absolutely. You don't just have to work with the RS volume and VDBs. Okay, so let me just rotate this because my volume is actually on, my, on its side. Uh, let's maybe pull it up. So this is my gas explosion. Also, one quick thing that I think I forgot to say is if it comes in and you think it's really, really small, we can actually scale up our volume really, really easily with the coordinates tab. So if we head over to the RS volume, go to coordinates, we can just scale this up. Nice and simple. Cool, right, so let's get back to actually doing this because I'm very quickly running out of time. Right, so the things that we need is we need a volume affecting light and then we need a volume shader material. So again, nice and simple setup. I like to keep these setups like as simple as I can just to show you the uh, to show you the features without getting too too elaborate. Target tag my redshift volume. Uh, let me just reposition this. Cool. Kick this off. We're not going to see anything, and that's because even though we have a volume contributing light, and what I mean by that is, if we go into our light and we go into details, we have contribution, ray contribution options. And what we mean by volume contributing is our light has to be contributing to our volume in here. I'll switch it off when we have a material, so I'll show you what, what I mean by it not contributing. The next thing we need is a redshift volume material. I'm going to throw that on my RS volume. And again, nothing happens. And that's because we need to set up our channels. So if I double click my material, come into here. Inside of here, we have channel information. And so when you work with VDBs, when you export them, people will know this if you work with Exposure FX or other uh, software like that, you can export particular data or channel data with your VDB. In our case, we have density, flames, and temperature. That's perfect. We're going to use density and we're going to use temperature to help kind of create the look of our, our VDB here, our volume. So what we're going to do we're going to come into our RS volume. Our scatter, think of scatter as like your diffuse, your absorption as your transparency, and then your emission as incandescence or self-illumination. That is kind of my artist-friendly way of thinking about them. So if I enter density into here, we now have some information happening. We have uh, some, uh, we can see something. We, we can see our volume because we're taking that density channel data. Another thing I'm going to do, let me just throw in a dome light so we can see everything a bit clearer. <coughs> Soz. <laughs> there we go. So, right, we can see this going on. And then what we're going to do, we're going to come down, and in my emission, I'm going to throw in my temperature. And what this is doing, it's emitting based on our temperature data, which previously what we'd do is we would just, we would colorize this based on the color of a flame. So if I throw in heat, we now have some color information. So in the real world, uh, the color or like the, the emission or the look of a, a smoke or explosion or fire is based on temperature. Well, with the new feature that's come in in Redshift 3.5.4 is we have the ability to do this with a different mode and that is black body emission. So if I just reset this to default, change my color mode, no sorry, my emission mode to black body emission. We now have a much more realistic looking VDB, much more realistic looking explosion, which can now be controlled with our temperature and offset values. So I can come in, I can pull this down, and we can now control this based on temperature like you would in the real world. We can also up our temperature and we can then increase our offset which is going to offset these values between the high and the low so if i increase my offset we're going to get these hyper hot blues because we have a hyper hot temperature 
And so this is such a nice and, and kind of like quick way of now creating realistic looking explosions. And so I talked about yesterday going into the advanced tab, how we can change these settings. I also talked about the new anisotropy is how our volume is going to react to incoming light. I don't have time to show that now, but feel free if you want to know about that stuff, check out yesterday's session. Um, it just kind of goes through those settings and what they mean in, in a little bit of detail. Heading back over to my keynote. So I wanted to save some extra time for this final little bit here. And, um, and I also talked about yesterday uh, some of the new things that are coming. So an improved random walk, uh, so an even better version of the one that we just saw. Redshift materials in the asset browser, nano VDBs, which are going to help working with volumes and working with uh, kind of like large file sizes inside of Cinema 4D and Redshift. And the final thing being kind of the secret feature. And this is something that is that is coming in the future, um, but it's something I can show, and that is material stacking inside of Cinema 4D and Redshift. So we're able to stack multiple materials onto the same object. We can adjust those materials individually, and we can now use the much loved texture mode uh, to move, scale, and rotate these individual, these individual kind of things. So if you work with like product viz and you have labeling, or you work with like graffiti or stickers, this is gonna just make that so much simpler. Instead of having to work with a material blender and adjust our remapping. So if anyone has worked with remapping and you have to like you know do like point zero zero one on the offset, you will like I feel your pain because I've had to do that too. So let me very quickly show you this before I wrap this up. So I have a super basic scene here. Um, and for anyone who's previously worked with material stacking, let's... I'm not going to show the older version because I don't have time. Let me just show you this, the original version. But normally what you'd have to do is you would have to blend materials inside of Redshift and you'd have to adjust uh, the offset value, work with the alphas, and you'd have to just, just tile all those up onto your object. Well, now we have like full control of this and it's so much easier uh, and just much more artist friendly to work with. So inside of here, we have a couple of like basic materials, just an asphalt floor and a cardboard texture. And th so this cardboard texture and model was from uh, Daniel Malik. So thank you, Daniel. You've saved me having to do this myself, which is great. So I'm going to throw these on here and we're just going to take a look at what this looks like. Let that render. Cool. So just a nice, simple scene we have going on just to demonstrate a bit of material stacking. So the way that we do this now is instead of having to build this all in one material and create material blending and kind of like split out our alpha, we can now do this on separate materials and just stack them up. And so I'm going to create very quickly a new material and grab my textures. So I have the Maxon logo here. Let me just pull that in. Plug that into our color channel. And for anyone who doesn't know, there's a really nice quick way if you're working with a PNG to split out the alpha. All we have to do, plug in your, your texture, use your alpha into the opacity. And then in a sec, we're good to go. We have our, we have our label or our sticker or our graffiti, however you want to be working. This is the way you'd set it up. We then drop it onto our cardboard box. And you might think it looks a little bit funny on the left-hand side, but we can already see the stacking happening. We can see the cardboard and we can see that second material. All we need to do, click that material tag. And if you're used to Cinema 4D, you'll be used to all of these settings. Change our projection to flat. Once we do that, if I come a little bit further out, we can then go into texture mode and we then get this wireframe. We can now move, scale and rotate and position exactly where we would want this logo. So let me just sort of get this little guy on here. So now we have, with complete ease and control, the ability to move this texture. We can then disable that tiling. Chances are we're not going to want that. And then now we have the ability to just position this wherever we want. So let me maybe rotate it. If I rotate it just to put it on the other side of the box. 
we now have that here. So this is great. And then all we have to do, if we want to stack these up and do more and more, we can just duplicate that. And all we have to do is change the texture. Let me just change this to this way up. And again, stack that on top, do the exact same thing, change it to flat, we're in texture mode already, scale that right down. And again, just switch off the tiling. So it's just a really nice way of now stacking materials that doesn't require us having to set up material blending or having to adjust that remap that kind of like those offset and those rotate values which for anyone who has done that you will like you you'll understand what i'm saying when i say this is nice and simple and so at the moment there's a limitation of six in this stacking and we have full control so a question that did come up yesterday was oh what if you have want to have the same cardboard bump on these well then all you have to do because they're individual materials is I'd maybe come in, I would grab my same bump setup, which is on my cardboard box, come into here, paste that in there, and then connect that in. And now I'm gonna have that same bump on this material as well. So that was like a super speed through of this, this kind of like new material stacking, uh, but what, what it can do, the ability to use texture mode now with Redshift is going to just be a, a bit of a game changer uh, for me, especially like I've worked with the previous way and it can be, it can be a little bit of a, of a nightmare. So yeah, so I, I feel like I totally rushed through that, but if anyone has any questions for me after, um, I'm more than happy to, to answer. <laughs> Thanks Ellie. We did have some great reactions whilst you were running through those sessions. So yes, thank you Ellie. No worries. The, um, and um, especially the, those details, like when you were talking about the scale setting in subsurface scattering yes. and the, the importance So that scale doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means, but when you point out what it's useful for, then yes. it opens it all up. Yes, definitely. No, it's, yeah, it's a good setting. Yeah, it's a great setting. And it's great because, like you said, it's not like necessarily about like the model it is about the model but it's about the material or type of material that you're creating yeah. so when it comes to you know like skin how much light is going to travel and scatter versus milk or jade for example and hello lux was saying hi hi hello lux i was saying random walk subsurface scattering is fire it <laughs> so is fire yes, absolutely <laughs> so when was random walk added um I don't know the exact date. I think it was maybe like four weeks ago. So okay. Redshift 3.5.05 is random walk, but we're now on 0.06. Got already. it. So th this is the beauty of having all these regular updates on Redshift. Yes, yes. Constantly improving stuff. New features. Constantly. Absolutely. Um, there was a question um, about where did the VDB come from? This is from William. I think we answered it on the chat. It's Django FX. Django FX. Yes. Yeah. Loads of different. I think there's also, is there openvdb.com? Might also do a bunch. Uh, all for free, all to use. Fantastic. Great, save you doing it yourself. Um, MTO Creations has asked, would material stacking be good for imperfections too, maybe? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I would always, I guess it depends on the imperfection. Like for me, if it was like a material with scratches, you would want to do that inside of your original material because then you can create that in a that in a bump on your base material but if you wanted to add maybe like genuine elements of dust you could do it with material stacking i think it's kind of like an either or situation for me the reason that like for me the thing that's so great about material stacking is the ability to use texture mode and to move scale and rotate so when it comes to product viz adding labels that's where this is really going to sort of like dive in whereas imperfections because they're a little bit more random and they're a little bit more all over you could probably still do the material blend away which is what i will do oh, that's a good workaround yeah. Fantastic. We, we are running out of time, yes. uh, but I just <laughs> wanted to mention that Hispano USA asked a question about 
um, bringing Redshift into After Effects via Cineware. And so that's technically possible. It, they're asking for a demonstration of it. We can't do it, I don't think, on this <laughs> session. But um, please email us at training at maxon.net. And we can add yeah, this to, up. yeah, we, we can add this to one of the sessions. Perhaps on our, the next Ask the Trainer, Perhaps. we can demonstrate this. Yes. The, the perks of having live sessions, you know, almost every other day. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And so also don't forget to go back to 3dmotionshow.com and you can sign up for just notifications about our sessions. Not just this show, but the ones that we do them every month, 3D Emotion Show. So um, then, then that will give you a notification of the stuff that's coming up and the artists that we've been inviting on. And so talking of artists, we have Weight of Thought here, standing in the wings, waiting to be introduced, <laughs> um, and who's going to be talking about some very interesting things with sci-fi loops in cinema. So we're very excited for that again. Um, but thank you again, Ellie. Thank, thank you. you for explaining some things so uh, clearly and uh, making them understandable, <laughs> like you do every week for the Maxon training team. <laughs> Did we mention the training team? Shameless plug. <laughs> All right. So thanks again. Thank you. And st stick so with much. us for Weight of Thought. Thanks.